Welcome to the, uh, the next lecture and I would say the next part of the course. So um, starting from today, I would say for the next two weeks, we are going to go into the topic of autonomous thermal machines. Um, and so before I begin that, um, perhaps a little bit of motivation. Actually, somebody had asked a very interesting question that already touched on this topic. So the first part of um, the course where we studied virtual qubits and we ended up with this way of using the swap operation to make changes to sort of cool something down or heat something up or do a, a process we're interested in. Um, at that point, we realized that if we want to sort of enact um, a change on a system, we would potentially have to repeat operations. So in particular, when we had this, the, the picture of two qubits with which I create a virtual qubit that can then swap with the third one, the problem was that, of course, the, the virtual qubit that I create within the system does not have normalization one. And so every time I used it to swap uh, with an external system, I would not actually get to the final temperature I wanted in one operation, so I'd have to repeat it, which is fine. So then what we have to do is we have to reset this, the virtual qubit that we created in some fashion and then swap it again. But this process now where we go unitary, then reset, then unitary, and so on and so forth. This is very intensive. This is very, um, let's say, resource intensive. And there are two ways to see this. Um, the first way is to say, well, if I need to do this, I, I really need a complicated machinery that's going to have a sort of a step. It's almost like a conveyor belt to go through different operations. Another way of seeing that is that it also requires a clock. So it, requires a clock. And why is this? This is because if I write down what a unitary operation is, of course, I, the fact that I do a unitary on a system doesn't come just magically. It always has to be the exponent of some Hamiltonian that the system evolves according to for a particular time as well. So I need to do two things. I need to choose a Hamiltonian. This could be a magnetic field. It could be a pulse, whatever it is. And it has to happen for a particular amount of time, because if I don't choose T correctly, I'm not going to get U, I'm going to get something else. And so this means that I require a clock to trigger the operation. So now if I go back to this, this picture where I do a, unitary, a swap unitary, then I reset, a swap unitary, and I reset, I see now it's actually very intensive. I, if I'm if I'm working on a single qubit, it's it seems a bit ridiculous because I'm going to have a huge machinery that just does very tiny operations for a lot of cost on, on one qubit. Um, and so one of the things we want to do is to, to get away from this and to not not have such intense uh, resource or such a high amount of resource that we or higher degree of control that we require. And this is something that we have in classical thermodynamics. So I can look at, for example. A uh, heat engine, so a car engine, for instance. And if I think about a car engine, what do I do? I'm, I'm now not talking about electrical cars, I'm talking about combustion driven cars. You turn the ignition, the engine turns on, and then it stays on. It's, it's consuming thermal resources, but it doesn't require us to sort of intervene in its operation. So, of course, the engine, just like many other thermal machines, it goes through a Carnot, approximate Carnot cycle with the, with the piston, but it's not like somebody has to go, oh, the engine has finished one cycle, now I have to put it in the next thing, now it has finished another cycle, I have to put it in the next thing. So basically, it's once it's begun, it runs, well, I'm going to say indefinitely here, because it's not indefinite, because the fuel will run out, but assuming that you have a constant supply of fuel, the engine would keep running on its own. So it, it sort of powers its own process. So we know this is true for classical thermal machines, and we want to do something similar for quantum thermal machines. Um, and indeed, so I, I drew this picture, and this is a picture that I would, let me draw it again on this side. This is somehow our, our goal to describe uh, a fridge. So what we would want is the following. Uh, no, actually, match, match the notation of the papers. Let me draw the bigger one in the center. So I have a system, the room temperature, and I have a hot. So this is my system, which I'm going to call C. This is a room temperature bath, and this is a hot bath. And the point will be to cool this down. 
it's going to be connected to its own bot potentially at TC. This is connected to its own bot at TR, and this is connected to its own bot at T hot. And we have already described discrete operations, what we would do. We would look at the virtual qubit here. We would create using these two thermal states. We would see what the virtual qubit is here. We would swap it with this one. Then we would reset that virtual qubit, swap it again. And now we are going to discuss how to turn it into a continuous process. Okay, so what will I begin with? So first of all, there are two things in the discrete operation. The first thing is the swap, which will go, so from, yeah, so it'll go to an interaction Hamiltonian. So U essentially will go to H. Now, what is the swap unitary? Imagine that I just write the swap unitary for two qubits. Um, so U was essentially of this form, one, 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 zero, one, and then zero is everywhere else. Zero, one, which swap into each other. That was a swap unitary, right? And so now what I do is I replace it with a Hamiltonian and the obvious choice of Hamiltonian is one that will generate the swap unitary. Uh, and so now there are actually many choices here. And the typical one that is chosen is the Hamiltonian H int is equal to really the generator at the sigma X operator in that space. One zero zero one plus zero one. One zero. Okay, so when I say there are many options, what I mean is that if you want to um, do a unitary that swaps the populations of two states, uh, all you have to do, thinking about this again as a block sphere, if I want to swap one to zero, all I have to do is to rotate around any vector that's perpendicular. So I could use an X operator in this space. I could also use a Y operator in this space. So for instance, the thing with I and minus I would also work in that respect. But uh, the, the choice in the papers that are sort of known in this field is for x to be the x operator, for the Hamiltonian to be the x operator, okay? So I can now think, imagine that I go back to this discrete setting and instead of applying this unitary, I said, oh, I'm just gonna turn this interaction Hamiltonian on and see what happens. What it's going to do is it's gonna keep rotating the space, which is of course not enough on its own because it will rotate the populations, then we'll rotate it back. And so we need something else together with it to, to complete the picture. Okay, is there any question about the swap Hamiltonian? Okay, so the next thing that we had in the in the um, discrete picture was the reset, which I'm now going to call thermalization in general. And the reason I say thermalization, so reset is actually more general. Thermalization is is a, a specific type of uh, resetting, is because. When we create a virtual qubit by, from two thermal states, the easiest way in order to get uh, the virtual qubit back to its original state is just by resetting each of the two the qubits that we used back to the original thermal state. So essentially what I want is, I want the room temperature thing to, to go back to the state of uh, described by the environment temperature and the hot one to go back to the state described by the hot temperature. So this is now reset, but in a very specific form. So it's the thermal reset. Okay, so the, the CPTP map corresponding to this was very, very, very simple. I would just take, uh, for a single system, it was just rho goes to tau. And for um, multiple systems, it was, uh, so for example, if I had A and B, and I want to reset A, then what I would do is uh, I would take rho AB, and it would go to, I trace out A, Okay, let me do it this way. So I trace out A. So I have a system on, state only on B, and then I put back the state that I want on A. So say tau A, and so that. So that was the map, right? And so now I want to consider what is the continuous version of this. So this we will discuss a bit more when we come to Limbladen theory, but the simplest version of it would be the following. I say that in time dt, a small time dt, I have a probability 
uh, or I say not a probability, a rate, or uh, let's call it gamma, a rate gamma to reset. So this is the this is the continuous version now that I use. What's that going to give me? So basically, this is now for a small dt. It's now back to the channel picture. In every small dt, I either keep it the same or I reset it. And so just going back to the single case, it would be something like this. So rho of t plus dt would be, well, with the probability that, with the rate that I just said, gamma times dt, it would reset. So that would give you tau. And with the remaining probability, which is one minus gamma dt, it would stay the same. Okay, so this is the sort of founding equation of it. And now I can, of course, take this and make it into a, into a differential equation. So d rho by dt, which is minus rho t, uh, t by dt limit. Well, I don't, will not need the limit now because I've only kept the first order things. Um, this is going to give me gamma times tau minus rho of t. Still keeping the rho of t, but at some point I will stop writing that when it's implied. Okay, so yes. Any questions? Yes. So you can you can somehow see that yeah the the rate of change of rho is just proportional to how far it is from tau. In fact, this particular equation is even though it's a matrix equation because of its simplistic form, it's very easily solvable. You can um, I mean it's it's an exponential solution whenever you have that the derivative of uh, f of x is proportional in any way with any sign to f of x, you get an exponential solution. So in this case, you would get that rho of t would be equal to rho of zero plus uh, e to the minus gamma t. Let's see if this is correct. Uh, no, sorry, this is tau. This is tau plus e to the minus gamma t of rho um, at time zero. So let's just call this rho naught. Now let's use the same notation, rho of zero minus tau. Okay. So at t is equal to zero, the tau and tau cancels, you only have rho of zero. But at t is equal to infinity, this vanishes and you only left with tau. So you actually basically exponent, you know, it's, this is sort of relaxing to the thermal state uh, is another way of saying this. Okay. Um, yes. Any questions? No? All right. Very good. So these are two equations. And now, um, so now imagine that I want to describe something like that thermal machine where I have, um, can I do a simpler version? No, let's let's start with that one. Okay, so I have my um, I have my three qubits. I want to cool the 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 first one by connecting it to the other two, but at the same time, each one of them is resetting to a to a, a thermal state. Now, you may ask the question, why should the left one be reset? Because for the working of the machine, all I need is that the the R and the H are reset in order to get the correct state. And the point, of course, is when I actually run a fridge, the reason we run a fridge is because the thing that we want to cool down typically is also sort of extracting heat from its environment. So it's not the case that uh, you, you cool it down and then it just remains cold. In some way, it's connected to the environment, so you have to keep the fridge running because it itself is, is sort of dissipating with its environment. So, so it's, in some sense, the, the TC, the, the bath on the left-hand side is somehow in competition with the ones on the, on the, the other two ones there. Okay, so now let me go back to the figure and say, okay, what do we have in that? So I'm constructing now. I'm constructing a fridge. So they are, there is the reset, so there's a thermalization. For C, for R, and for H. Okay, so for the C qubit, the R qubit, and the H qubit. And there is now the, the interaction Hamiltonian. So there's the interaction. Now, what is the interaction between? So this is now slight. 
It's the first time we do it with three qubits, so point remains the same. Um, yes, so with these two qubits, if I was to draw the joint system of the two of them, with these two, it would look something like this. And it was this interaction, oh, this is the, the virtual qubit that we would create that was of interest to us, right? So it's, this is the virtual qubit that actually, now of course it's not to scale because I ran out of space, but this is the one that would couple there. Um, and what we want to do is to do a swap between this one and that one. So what do we have? So the, the lower energy state, let me draw it this way now. So we have C still, but here we have the joint system of H and R. And what are the states? This is zero, zero, R, H. This is a lower energy, so this will be zero, one. R H because H has a smaller energy gap, one zero R H and one one R H and this is zero C and this is one C, okay? And so now when we swap, do the swap between these two, remember when we swap, we always swap the high energy state, low energy state with the one opposite. So we're going to be swapping the two states, which is a different color, zero, one zero on C, R and H with the state one zero one on the same. Plus of course the Hermitian conjugate. Okay. And now going back to the figure, we see why zero one zero with one zero one. This basically means so think about zero one zero. This is the ground here, the ground here and the excited there. And when you flip it, you basically take heat from the cold and from the hot and you put it into the room temperature bath. Okay, so I'm about to get to the, the how the energy should be related, but effectively what we're doing is we're taking from the cold, we're taking from the hot, and we're dissipating into the room temperature, which is exactly how an absorption fridge would work. So. So we have our interaction. H int, which now I've said is, uh, well, it's, yeah, it's proportional to 101, 010, zero, one, zero, plus emission conjugate. I put the opposite, but plus emission conjugate means it's you're always symmetric, so it doesn't matter. Okay, so how do I write now the evolution of such a system? At the moment, without justifying it further, I'm going to assume that I can essentially add all of these different processes together. So each of these processes is a is a is going to be added. So I have that d rho by dt is equal to. So first of all, usually what people write is the Hamilton in part. So first I write the Hamilton in part, and this is going to be the usual Hamilton in evolution. So h int. So in fact, I wrote proportional to, but you can you can write equal to g times this whole thing. That's a typical choice. Oh. That's going to come in the way. Let's not. Let's just put it in. Put it there. Um, H int comma rho. This, by the way, is, is just a density matrix form of Schrodinger's equation. I'm guessing you've seen it before. Uh, and now I add the, all of the rest. So what are all of the rest? So I would say plus the sum over x. And x is going to take three values. So it's going to be from the set C, R, and H for each of those things. And this is going to be the dissipator or the reset equation for the thing. So it would be trace um, over ah, so gamma X and trace over X of rho tensor tau X minus rho. So I did not... Uh, did not explicitly discuss it, but this was what we did here was, is, was only for the, um, the single system reset. And we do it for multiple systems. You do it exactly the same way here. Instead of resetting to tau, you basically reset to tau only on one system. So you trace out the, the, the one that you're interested in resetting. You put back the state of the reset that you want. And then of course the minus tau is just the, the part from the differential equation. 
Okay. Are there any questions about this? Okay. So this is what we call a master equation. Also, this is a master equation simply because it gives us the evolution of um, d rho by dt. So we're writing d rho by dt, and so I call it a master equation. But it's also in Lindbladian in Bladian form. And this is what I'm going to talk about next. That's great. Use the sunlight to help dry the board. Um, right. So, in Bladens. Okay. Um, so, to discuss in Bladens, we come back to the picture now that we've been looking at repeatedly over the last couple of weeks. I have a big thing, a big system, out of which I'm interested in a smaller system. So I have system, and I have environment, okay? And the point is, assuming that this whole thing now is, is closed and isolated, we know we can write down the evolution of this one. We can say that um, d of rho as e by dt is equal to minus i some global Hamiltonian as e comma rho as e. The problem, of course, is that if you're not interested in the environment and we only want the system, then we would like something that only tells us something about the system. So what we would typically like is, is what is rho s as a function of t. Okay. Now, in general, this is something that you cannot get without actually including the environment description. And the reason is, of course, about is entanglement and correlations. So one very simple example that you could work out quite easily is, Imagine that you took, um, instead of S and E, just take A, B, and you have that row of zero. Um, so row A, B at time zero, take it to be one of the maximally entangled states. So let's say, uh, five plus, five plus, where if I remember correctly, five plus is zero, zero plus, one, one upon square root of two. We take this. Yes. Actually, okay. Let me let me see what I would like. So I want want something that is yeah. Okay. So rho is one, 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 and one with a of course one out of four here. One over, oh, one over two. Thank you. Sorry. Do I want this? No. This might be this might be more difficult to to work out. So let me do the one with because I'm I've been talking about the swap, so this would be an easier one to do. So one 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 one. So this is now psi plus psi plus with zero one and one zero. Now. Um, I basically have a, a density matrix that is just in this subspace. So one of the things I could do is I could consider a Hamiltonian, a joint Hamiltonian HAB, 
that rotates in this subspace. So the one that would basically rotate you towards the state um, where you just have one, zero, zero, one. Uh, oops, sorry, zero, zero with a half here. So rotation in the subspace. And of course, then it would also go back to the same state after a particular amount of time. Now, if I was to do this, um, and, uh, ooh. no, 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 sorry. This, then it would come back, well, this is, this is gonna take the whole board, a very bad idea. So the one that this, what we would do is I ignore the rest of the subspace again. So I, I eventually I will go into this state and then I will recur. So the, yeah, one half is gone, yeah. So I'm in this, I'm, I'm in this X, where well, basically I'm in the plus state in the subspace and then I rotate to the zero state the sigma z state, then I rotate probably the minus state. So of course, between these, there will be one with the minus one, minus one, and then back to the to the other computational state and vice versa. So it's just a rotation in subspace. So I choose a Hamiltonian for that. So the Hamiltonian in this case would be, I guess, sigma y in that subspace. And then I say, well, imagine that I only wanted to look at the state of, of A and ask, how is this evolving? This is actually a weird evolution on its own, because if I look at A, when I start off, A is in the maximally mixed state. As you know, if uh, if A B is in the is in a Bell state, then A is going to be in the maximally mixed state. But then all of a sudden, A gets into the pure state, of corresponding to the computational basis. Then goes into a well. In between here, there's going to be the Y, so another maximally mixed state, and then to a pure state. Now, if I write this as a differential equation on this on on A alone, this is actually a very weird evolution. It's it's not does not correspond to any Hamiltonian, that's for sure, and it will not it will not correspond to any master equation as well. And the reason is because there is entanglement between A and B and the Hamiltonian itself is very entangling. It's a sigma Y in that subspace. So typically I cannot write just DS. So this thing that I would like to write, which is some operator on A, on rho it's alone, rho S of T, this is not always possible. Okay. But if it is the case, just like with typicality and equilibration, if it is the case that the environment has some particular properties, in particular being large and complex, and I will describe these in a bit more detail, and the interaction between the system and the environment also has some nice properties, then it turns out to be the case that we can actually get this operator. Now, I will not go into the full theory of what these properties are, but I will write them out in words and describe them. So, what are the properties to get an Imbladian? So, for a Limbladian, we need the environment. So, so we need the environment must be, must have the following properties. So the first property is that of being large. This is actually a property that intersects with the other ones. Why large? So that, the state does not change significantly. So returning to this example of the maximally entangled state, the state of the other cube, but the state of B is, is changing also quite a lot as, as they are evolving. Whereas if you have, what you would like is you would have to like to have an environment that was so large that its own state while evolving with the system doesn't actually change much. And if you think about thermalization, like, oh, if I, have a, if I have a cup of hot coffee here, I mean, the room is so large that the fact that the coffee is dissipating heat into the room doesn't actually heat up the room. It's not, it's not, it's too small to have such an effect. So that's the first property. So again, large again means with respect to the system. If the system is also large, the environment has to be even larger. The second thing is that what you would like is that the correlation time scales are small. Um, and I'm not putting any more detail in this because really is um, there are many versions of this and I only wanted to say intuitively what it means. Um, again, returning to this example with a maximally entangled state, the reason that it creates problems is because you have entanglement between the system and, and well, between A and B. And in, the, in a situation where you had a more general case with S and E, 
if you have a Hamiltonian that interacts between them, you're always going to build up and sort of do stuff with correlations between the system environment. There's always going to be correlations like that. When I say that the correlation time scale is small, what I mean is that in, in each case, what you usually have is you have some sort of region. So I could sort of draw this as say, a region of the environment that is actually interacting with the system. So in the case of a coffee on the table, it would really be the air and sort of the locality of the coffee. And of course the system will build up correlations immediately with, its, with the boundary of the environment that it's in contact with. At the same time, because the environment is also a complex system with its own Hamiltonian, these correlations are going to dissipate into the, into the larger environment. And so this saying that the correlation time scale is small is saying that the dissipation of those correlations, the spreading out of, those, of that information to the rest of the environment is fast. So that the information about the system that remains in this boundary at any given time is actually very small because it's dissipating very fast into the environment. Okay? And again, with the example of a coffee, the reason this is true is because, well, the diffusion of air is very fast. So the, the, even though it is the case that the, so you could look at it this way. If you look at the air just next to the coffee, it will be a bit hotter than the general thing because of course it's in contact with the coffee, but it won't be very hot because the air itself diffuses the heat and the particles move around very quickly. So that's the second thing. And then the th last thing is that, so no memory effect. So, uh, so again, this is not completely independent of the first two. It's just to say whatever um, correlations the environment gains with the system, when they dissipate, it, there is no such thing as a recurrence. So it's not like at some later point of time, they will end up back in the boundary and will affect the uh, evolution of the system, which is exactly the opposite of the example we just had. Here we have that the, the, um, the state of B has a lot of memory about what's happening with A. So we could, we could actually know exactly where the evolution of, of this system was by looking at state, the state of B. If B was in the maximally mixed state, then we would say, oh, actually they are maximally entangled. We know that the two of them are in one of the Bell states. If B was in a pure state, we would know, oh, okay, A is also in a pure state because there's full information in B about A. So this, and the reason I say it's not independent is again, when you have a large environment, this becomes easier. If you, if you for example, had a small environment, then this would no, could no longer be true because there, was, there would be no place for the information to escape. So you would have recurrence. Uh, most probably you would have uh, recurrence effects. Okay, so loosely speaking, when you have an environment that satisfies these three things, what you could end up with is the following case. So you have a, a system now that I, um, S, and it's evolving in time. And what you have is that uh, the evolution of the system is given by the, a map with the following properties. So you have that the system evolves in time with a certain map, let's call it capital lambda T. And capital lambda T has the following two properties. So first of all, it's, it's just well behaved. So it's uniformly continuous. This is, not so much of, a, of an assumption as, as a consequence of the fact that physics, as long as you're doing physics with systems that, even if they're infinite dimensional, the energy scales are not infinite, you always have to have a uniformly continuous dynamics at the scale of, um, of any subsystem that you look at. So this is one of, uh, of the things. And the second is the combination of all of those three, what they gives you is something we call Markovianity, which is, related but slightly different to the notion of CP divisibility, but I'm not going to go into this distinction either. Um, and this is to say that you, uh, these, oh, so when I say S, uh, it evolves as T, what I mean is that rho of T is equal to this operator acting on rho of zero. Okay, so that, that's what this means. So the evolution of T means that rho of T is always given by this. Uh, universally, uh, uniformly continuous and um, didn't say this, but CPTP, so it's completely positive, trace preserving. And this says that lambda of T can be broken down into the composition of maps um, and this, oh, not capital lambda. The same family S composed with the T minus S. 
Okay, so I have a I have a map that's parameterized by t, and I also can divide it. So if I say, well, I can look at not just t but some point s in between zero and t. Well, it'll be given by the map at s composed with the map t minus s. Okay, so this essentially what this is encoding is that the generator of the map, well, the, the map itself is is translation invariant. It doesn't matter whether I look at it from one second to three seconds. That will be the same map as three seconds to five seconds, for example. And if I want to break it down from one to two is the same as two to three, three to four, four to five. So I'll, this is what it means by CP divisible. Okay. Now, what we get from that statement, and I've run out of space, so I'll use the next code. Incidentally, um, another word for that is to call it a semi-group. So the maps, the family of maps form a semi-group. Uh, oh, should have kept this. Right, I want to write it back down. So, so when we have that that is satisfied, then what follows is that lambda of t can always be written in the form e to some Limbladin operator times t. Um, and the Limbladin operator is defined, has to be of the following form. So Limbladin on rho is given by minus i h comma rho. Now this is Hermitian, so just like a Hamiltonian, plus the sum over k of lk rho lk dagger minus half LK dagger, LK comma row. And that's also in the sum, so. Okay. So if you have Markovian dynamics, um, where you do not depend on the environment and they're also well, divisible in, uh, they form a nice uniformly continuous semi-group, then it turns out that you can always write a generator for the dynamics. So you don't have to write down all of the maps, you can just write down a single generator. Yes? Oh, yeah, the same as. I don't know why I made them curly. I was thinking of the Limbladin already. No, no, they're the same as. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. I, I uh, yes, my usual notation is I, I use curly L for the Limbladin and just normal uh, letters for the, uh, the jump operators. So we call these jump. Jump operators. Okay. Um, yes. So H has to be Hermitian, but the LK are really completely general. Of course, they have to. Um, they are operators on the system, so they are of that size. But they they are not constrained to be Hermitian or well behaved in any other manner. They, they can be completely arbitrary matrices. Okay. Um, very good. One of the things that you will do, I think, in one of the tutorials, uh, is to derive this by just looking at the dynamics of an arbitrary quantum system for small time, assuming that the, the dynamics do not depend on the environment. And so you'll be able to derive the Limbladin form from that. Okay, good. Any questions? All right, so now an obvious question is, I've just said that this is the case, but uh, here I had a particular equation. So d rho by dt is equal to minus i h comma rho plus that, that was my equation for the thermal machine. Um, and it, well, the Hamiltonian part looks the same, but the second part does not look like this one. So the obvious question would be, well, is the reset equation actually in that form or not? I've already given the answer away, yes it is. So even though you can write the reset equation in that very simplistic form, you can actually check that it in fact can be also written in, in this form, okay? Um, and there is, is there more to say about that? So. Basically, one of the easiest ways of picking jump operators corresponding to what you would like to do is, so imagine that I wanted to pick jump operators corresponding to my thermalization. Then what would I do? I would say, well, imagine now I have a system that's a qubit. Okay. And I want to thermalize it. Okay. So what does thermalization mean? Well, if I think about the qubit, states zero and state one, 
I want the populations of zero and one to sort of go to the, to the values they would be given by, by the Gibbs ratio. So in particular, I could do this if I had a flow of population in this direction, let's call this um, gamma down, and this one to be gamma up. If I had a rate such that gamma up upon gamma down is equal to e to the minus beta times e. And the reason being that, well, I know that I will have, I will have a steady state when the probability of being up times the rate of going down is equal to the probability of being down times the rate of going up, because that would mean that the flow of population in the both directions is the same. And so this gives me now that that means that rho up by rho down should be equal to P1 by P0. So if I want P1 by P0 to at that steady state to correspond to the thermal things, I have to make it the, the Gibbs ratio. So I need to pick this. Okay. And so now I can pick, um, and now I can erase this. Let me pick the jump operators to be exactly those. So I say, so I pick one jump operator. I call it uh, L, yeah, okay, L0. And I pick it to be this, one, zero. And I pick L1 to be zero, one. It's very simple. So this is the state that takes in a vector zero and outputs one. The other one takes in one and outputs zero. Okay. And of course, when I do them here, I can always multiply by the, ah, I did not, what I didn't put here is to say that you can have some rates gamma k. And the important thing is that we write this in red, gamma k is greater than zero. So if you have gamma k less than zero, then it will no longer be CPTP generating. But as long as the rates here are, are greater than zero, you are fine. Uh, not well, not if they're negative. And the reason is because so the L's are completely arbitrary, but you see L L dagger L, that's always a positive operator. So so for example, if you if you wrote a negative gamma here and you try to absorb it here, you 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 wouldn't be able to because this gives you a this would you well you wouldn't be able to in general. Yeah, because gamma's uh multiplying the whole thing. But yes, for any positive gamma, yes, you can. So you can take you you'd redefine it as square root of the gamma L and then it's it's taken. Yeah. The usual, yeah, the, indeed, the usual reason to have the gamma outside is because it tells you something about the physics. Because now what I would do is I would say, let me write down a Limbladen L. So I would write down my D rho by DT, for example, is equal to a limb, um, just, the, just the dissipating things with these two. So it would be gamma, let's call it gamma down, which is the one that goes to zero. And then I have L1 rho L1 dagger minus half anti-commutator L1 dagger L1 rho, so this is one thing, and then plus gamma up, and the same thing now, but with L0. L0 is the one that goes up, and L1 is the one that goes down. That may have been a bit of a weird choice, but now we've made it, so we stick to it. Okay, um, and so one of the things you can do is you can, you can actually put in now the thermal state into this, this equation, and you, would, you should see that you get zero. So d rho by dt is zero when you put in the thermal state here. And the reason being that if, if I just take this term here, let's look at it. So L1 rho L1 is zero, one, rho, one, zero, which is just, this is the state that comes out and it's multiplied by the number one rho, one. So it's basically the, the element of rho in the population of rho in the first excited state, but now that's been put into the zero state. Um, and then on the other side, you have the, a similar thing that competes the other way. Okay. Um, the important thing is that, so these terms, when you have jump operators are very simple. They just transfer the population up and down. These terms, what they end up doing is dephasing. So what they do is they act in the end on the off diagonal elements to simply decrease them. So they will contribute a term to your differential equation. That's just, so it, it will essentially give you a, a relation of d p by dt is equal to some minus gamma p. This sort of an equation where p is that, that the, well, maybe not, let's call it x. So an equation that essentially corresponds to exponential decay right down to zero. 
So when you, when you, and I think this is a nice thing for you to try out because it's simplest case, when you put in an arbitrary matrix, arbitrary qubit density matrix into this, what you should see is that the off-diagonal terms just decay to zero, and the on-diagonal terms, they decay, well, they don't decay, but they relax to the thermal values and will become a thermal state in the long time limit. Okay. Um, I don't know whether it's a tutorial question, but one of the interesting things to do is to take the reset equation for a qubit and convert it into this form. Because in the end, you have L0, you have L1, but you also have to ha add another thing that's proportional to sigma z in order to get an actual match of all of the quotients. So this is something, if you're interested, you can try, but it's not, it's not essential to do it either for the course. OK, um, and with that, I would conclude this. Next, uh, so now we are set up so that next Wednesday, I can actually return now to the model of the fridge and discuss with the full master equation with all of the different terms, what is the results we get and talk about thermal machines in general. Uh, any questions? Oh, this, no? All right, thank you very much. See you next Wednesday.